Earlier this week, Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden held a virtual summit. There was a lot at stake. Relations between these two countries have not really been great over the past few months or for years for that matter. And there was a lot of hope that there might be some amount of breakthroughs made that the discussions could have some positive outcomes. However, it's still not clear what these outcomes are. We'll be talking about this as well as more on Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkayas, sir. Prabir, so uh, like I said, the meeting, the much anticipated meeting took place, of course. There, were, uh, there was no joint declaration. There were statements released by both the sides. Media coverage, of course, focusing on some of the flashpoint issues, the Western media talking about human rights, about Taiwan, about you know all these kind of issues. Two days later, Biden says that the US is considering a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Games. So, keeping all this in mind, how do we really, how do you really see this summit and what came out of it? Well, you know, the first thing is that two presidents have started talking. Now, given the kind of relationship that has taken, has been there for quite some time, as you said, with Trump, uh, it, it had reached a certain point. It appeared that Biden might bring down the temperature, but that didn't happen. So, we saw, as you remember, you know, tense meetings between the two sides and that has continued till now. So does it mean a return to normalcy? Normalcy means that we'll have the usual competition, we'll shout at each other, we'll use each, you know, any instance that, that we can bring up to bash the other. But nevertheless, there will be certain things which will be business as usual. Right. Now, is that going to happen? We don't know. It really depends on two major issues. One is, of course, the uh, Taiwan issue. Now, on Taiwan, there has been a certain tension because Biden has been, to put it diplomatically, a little loose with his understanding of what the relationship between Taiwan and the United States is. As we know, for a long period, the US considered the mainland China to be a part of Taiwan because at that time Chiang Kai-shek is who they recognized as they called the Republic of China. Uh, the, and they said that he represents the whole of China, but he was in Taiwan. So their position from the beginning has also been that Taiwan is a part of China. And of course, that's been the uh, Chinese position as well. So both sides, are at least united on this common understanding that Taiwan is a part of uh, Taiwan is a part of China. Nevertheless, that there are two different systems is what the Americans say. And how do they handle it? They handle it by creating a gray zone, right. about not talking about it, mm -hmm. and uh, maintaining yes, military relationship with China that we with the Taiwan that we know, but creating a kind of gray. Uh, deniability uh, kind of atmosphere around the issue of Taiwan, which they now seem to want to break, particularly there are a lot of military opinion in the United States, what would, we'd call with the, the strategic uh, companies to uh, strategic retired officers who are saying in very open terms that we should recognize Taiwan, have a military relationship and defend Taiwan against Chinese aggression if it takes place. But again, the, uh, the, this is a very dangerous territory to right. get into. And that's what China has been war warning them. As long as it is gray, you don't spell it out, we, okay, that's one thing. But if you want to say, no, Taiwan is independent of China and you recognize it, then it changes the ball game altogether. Exactly. So that is the issue that Taiwan is bringing up with both the sides. And of course, the United States has a key problem that Taiwan today holds the whip hand with respect to number of chips, the, the, at least the, the, what is called the less than 10 nanometer chip production. They are the biggest suppliers in the world, almost 90% of the world's production. So given that, strategically, particularly with the tech war they're having with China, this becomes even more important. Right. So I think that issue still remains unresolved because two days after it, Biden talked about Taiwan's independence again. And what you said, yes, there have also been 
uh, talking about boycott, but that's really not a significant issue. More rhetorical than anything. More else. rhetorical, <laughs> and it has uh, public implications, but really no strategic implications. The important part is there seems to be certain talks which have restarted, including military discussions between Russia, uh, between China, and the United States. And I think we'll have to wait and watch that can they have certain normal relationships while maintaining their contested relationships. Is it possible? Normal in some things, but contesting in certain other spheres. That we'll have to see. But I don't see a waning of the economic war that is going on. Right. What we call really the trade sanctions war, war <laughs> trade war, tech war, sanctions war, which the US has really launched against China. Because China is economically emerging as the more powerful uh, country. And over a long period, say 20, 30 years, the US does seem to and acknowledge that China will become the preeminent economic power and considering it's a much bigger population than the United States. So given all of this, I think the US and China are in for a long, long-term contestation, political and economic space. And that can have dangerous flashpoints. Hopefully, this discussion will manage to temper some of that. Right. Ravi, staying with the uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia region, so uh, there have been a number of incidents, we'll talk about all of them. So the most recent incident, of course, was the fact that South Korea raised an alarm when they said that Chinese and Russian fighter jets had passed through their, what is called the Air Defense Identification Zone. Now the ADIZ has become a big term in journalism, in the strategic community these days, especially with respect to Taiwan. But this was seen as, you know, yet another incident of tensions building in that area, etc., etc. So could you maybe take us through exactly what the ADIZ is and what happened? Well, the ADIZ is a concept which was introduced in 1950 or so by the United States and Canada and saying anybody coming across a line that we define as our air defense identification zone, not our air defense zone or our you know, air space, which is what the legal uh, position is that X countries air space, not that, but outside of it. So this was started, as I said, by US and Canada. A number of countries have adopted, I think there are 20 or 30 odd countries, which have also proclaimed ADIZs, including India, for instance, as well as China. But all of it is voluntary that these are not agreements reached with any country or is not, or any understanding of what an air defense identification zone could be. These are unilateral declarations. Right. And the US itself says that if it does not accept any country's ADIZ, they will not inform any country if they are going just passing through the ADIZ and not in, in, intending to enter the airspace of that country, they have no obligation to inform that country. So this is the US position. And it is the US newspapers, the media organizations who are really creating this ruckus about China violating the ADIZ of various countries, in this case, Korea, earlier of Taiwan. Again, Taiwan AD, ADIZ, if you take a look, or you take the Korean ADIZ look, or you take a look at the Japanese ADIZ look, you will find that they are very expansive. In fact, the Japanese air defense identification zone intersects with the Korean air defense identification zone. You can see that they are you know, crossing each other. So they themselves may be allies, but doesn't mean their air defense identification zones are therefore negotiated between right. the two of them. They overlap, and this is also common in many various other areas where the air defense identification zones unilaterally declared are then overlapping. It's interesting the way the Western media plays this up. It's not they don't know what an ADIZ means. In fact, they quite often label it in the headline as air defense zone. Right. And only in the, in the body of the article, in small letters, you will find air defense identification okay. zone. So you get this feeling that China is violating the airspace of different countries, but these are not airspace. Right. And there is no sovereign claims regarding air defense identification zone. And that is something not, as I said, not what I'm saying or what anybody else is saying. This is what the United States itself is saying. So given this fact, this kind of 
uh, noise that is created, I think there is a political message being given here that this is a this is today a stage of strategic competition with China right. and any stick is good enough to beat the Chinese with and if the Russians also get uh, battered in this process even more better. to the good right. even better the same thing happened with Taiwan also recently there was Chinese aircraft entering the ADIZ continuously a lot of ruckus created around that well as you know the ADIZ of Taiwan uh, goes over the mainland of China as well so Chinese are supposed to inform the Taiwanese if a flight takes off from those parts of China which would be quite absurd so this absurdity aside if you take the ADIZ issue that came up with, uh, between Taiwan and uh, China, you will see that those overflights which went at that point of time was really going over uh, the ADIZ which projects quite a distance away from uh, Taiwan towards its south. And if you see the direction they were going, they were really going towards South China Sea because they were essentially naval exercises being carried out by the United States Navy in that area. So this was not directed at Taiwan. It was really directed at looking at what the naval ships of the United States were doing in an area which is for China sensitive. Yes. South China Sea, as you know, is contested by various countries in terms of economic resources, exclusive economic zones. So there are territorial claims over this island patches as I was talking about who owns what reefs, shores, right. uh, islands, and so on. So all of these have been issues that have been something highly contested between all the neighbors of the South China Sea. And the US, US was conducting military naval exercises over there. And that's why the overflights were taking place, right. because they were really going to observe what the Americans were doing. And that is what I was going to ask as well as about, about the US naval submarine, the USS Connecticut which in October apparently collided with an underwater mount. And this was a nuclear power submarine. People were a bit worried about, you know, what would happen. Apparently, the US sent a craft which can sniff out traces of nuclear material to see if there anything had gone wrong. Apparently, nothing did, thankfully. But what does this, for instance, say about this, uh, this area and this crisis, considering that people are very upset when Chinese aircraft, you know, travel a bit away from China, but there's a US nuclear submarine loose in this region, so to speak, which is actually getting into accidents. Now, the issue, I think, is relatively more sensitive than just a question of US naval submarine being near China or near Philippines or near Vietnam and so on. I think the issue really is that you have a nuclear submarine. Now, nuclear submarines, of course, going through South China Sea has dangers. Dangers, why? because this is not completely charted. The bottom of the sea has not been completely charted. Accuracy of that degree is not there in the maps that we have. And as you know, it's, it has been an ex-volcanic region. Right. And therefore, there's a, there has been a lot of volcanic mounds. And in fact, the Connecticut uh, description that the Navy, US Navy gives, calls it collision the sea mount, which means an extinct volcano. So given all of this, the question arises that how did this collision take place? Because after all, these naval submarines, particularly the, this, this vintage that we are talking about, these are expensive toys of the US Navy. Right. And they have a lot of equipment to see that these things don't happen. You have the active sonar which maps out what are the directions, are there obstructions in the way and so on. So the argument that naval experts have given, and not uh, naval experts from here, but from the US, <laughs> that the <clears throat> naval experts have given, is that possibly they have switched off their active sonar, right. and they're traveling by pa passive sonar. Why do they do that? Because then you cannot be detected easily that you're passing through these area, this particular area. So it, it is done when you want to do stealth missions, that you want to really sniff out things, what's happening over here, but you don't want to announce your presence. That is the possible reason why they were probably not, not uh, they are not, they had not activated their sonar. So active sonar was not on. They were doing what's called passive sonar. You can detect other uh, ships who are on, 
you know, we have the sonar signal on, right. but unfortunately the C mount doesn't. So therefore you have this problem right. that you could hit it. Mm -hmm. Now in this case, as you said, it looks like luckily that it did not cause any leakage of new, uh, nuclear materials mm -hmm. because as you know, it's a nuclear submarine, of course there's a nuclear reactor in it. Now this, this also brings out why a lot of the countries, including India, as well as the other countries in the region, it's not only China, but also the other ASEAN countries in that area, have also said that under UNCLOS, that if you are going to bring, bring ships which have nuclear weapons or are nuclear powered, you should inform the littoral states that this should not be something that should be, it constitutes bringing hazardous material right. in our exclusive economic zone. We are not saying you can't do it, but you should inform us. Now that is something the US does not agree. But having done what it has done, which is run a, a ground over there, damage its one of its naval submarines, I think they have just really increased the strength of the argument that it is the duty of any country using its naval uh, submarines, ships in that area, carrying hazardous material, including either nuclear weapons or nuclear uh, powered reactors, they should inform the countries. I think that's a new position that all of them would agree. Right. So the freedom of navigation, the US claims, is an unfettered right to uh, navigation, including the right to run aground of you know, uh, extinct volcanoes. That is a very difficult take. And I unfortunately, while we hear so much about ADIZ and so on, nobody has asked this question in Western media, where exactly did this submarine run aground? Mm -hmm. Where is it that it ran aground, where it could have created a much larger disaster than it did? Right. And that unfortunately, no answer has been forthcoming on this from the United States. They have remained silent, they have just said, South China Sea. That's it. Nothing more. That also after really it became public that the accident happened in South China right. Sea. And the Chinese raised it as well. Chinese have been raising it as well. Oh. But as you know, the Chinese voice does not carry in global Absolutely. media. Right. It's really the Western voice True. and particularly the US voice that is sort of uh, relayed by n number of other uh, support structures that the US has been able to build. Thank you so much, Prabir. Will better sense prevail and nuclear submarines not be deployed in sensitive zones such as the South China Sea? One can only hope. Meanwhile, we'll be covering such topics in Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.